At a time when the agricultural industry in California was booming and the Bracero program was still up and running, a barrier existed that deprived migrant farm workers of their natural and civil rights, making every working day unbearable. That was until one man united farm workers as one, and they rose up to break that barrier. That man was Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez was able to break that barrier by using nonviolent tactics to lead farm workers in a strike against their oppressors. Chavez's protest proved that nonviolence is demanding and difficult, yet effective and successful in the end. It was the year of 1942, and the U.S. had joined the inevitable struggle of World War II, sending more and more men to fight. During this time, labor shortages were increasing, and to make up for this, the U.S. government started the Bracero Program. The Bracero Program imported temporary laborers from Mexico to work in the fields and on railroads. The program was also seen as a way to help efforts against undocumented workers or programs of deportation. Soon, in 1947, California gained agricultural supremacy when its farm production first exceeded that of any other state, providing many jobs for laborers. By the late 1940s, the majority of the state's farm workers were Mexican. Then in 1962, the government ended the Bracero program. However, many Mexicans overstayed their Bracero program contracts and remained in the U.S. Not only that, but many Mexicans immigrated illegally to the U.S. to live a better life and to skip their country's poverty. Many migrant farm workers work in agricultural fields in California to support their family, but their working conditions made it impossible. Many farm owners, or growers as some people call them, would disregard and ignore state laws regarding working standards, thus causing working conditions that one cannot imagine. Farm workers who would pick harvest from the crops in 1965 were making an average of 90 cents per hour, plus 10 cents per basket. Farm workers had to play one quarter of a cup of water and drink that water from an old soda can that all workers had to share. In other ranches where the farm workers work had portable toilets. And this was especially humiliating for women as they had to hide behind the blanket when they had to go. Many farm workers would get sick because growers were not warned about the pesticides that were being sprayed. And to make things worse, growers didn't provide any burn any benefits for the workers. All farm workers during this time weren't getting paid very well, and many lived in small shacks or poor houses that weren't even decent. Most migrant farm work families couldn't even properly feed their children or clothe them, and to make ends meet, the children would work with their parents. Among one of the saddest things of all is that even pregnant women would work with to maintain their family. All these problems were caused by the government growers' exploitation of migrant farm workers. Farm workers are on the bottom of the economic class and they had no say whatsoever. The growers were the ones who had all the power. Ever since the early 20th century, growers have always exploited farm workers who were poor or immigrants, from Chinese to African Americans, Japanese, and now to Filipinos and Mexicans. They all built their wealth on um, their backbreaking labor. Overall, farm workers had to endure these hardworking conditions, one of them being Cesar Chavez. Cesar Strada Chavez was born in Yuma, Arizona on March 31, 1927. During the Great Depression, Chavez had lost their homestead and had resulted in moving to Northern California in the late 1930s. There, the Chavez family became migrant farm workers. It was during a workday that Cesar Chavez witnessed the hard working conditions that they were in and witnessed his parents be humiliated by the growers. It was because of this that he dedicated his life to gain rights for migrant farm workers. In 1962, Chavez created the National Farm Workers Association to bring dignity, justice, and rights to migrant farm workers. And by 1962, 1,200 farm workers had joined. Then, on September 16, 1965, Chavez held a very important meeting at, the church, at a church hall. Days before, the AOWC, a farm workers association mostly comprised of Filipinos who had also been working for the growers during that time, had also faced many hardships while working the agricultural fields had decided to go on strike against the growers. Larry Itliong, head of the AOWC, asked Caesar if the NFWA would join the strike as they knew they could not do it alone. One guy with no money, I mean, like, how was he going to take on the, the largest, most powerful industry? Finally, on the day of the meeting, Chavez asked everyone who gathered to make a vote to help the Filipino community with their strike against the growers. Everyone at the meeting unanimously agreed to join the Filipinos in the strike. The following few days, the Mexicans would finally join the Filipinos in the strike and walk out on their jobs. People would hold up signs encouraging other farm workers to join them in their strike. They would yell words of encouragement and would constantly yell huelga, strike in Spanish, and try to convince them. Filipinos and Mexicans together did all of this because they could not be done alone. Soon, people who worked in the field would finally resist the growers and join the strike. Each day, they would get more victories as more crews walked out. 
However, Caesar and their strike's victories were short-lived, as the growers would bring in more people to work for them. Growers would fire gunshots at strikers and would call the police. Soon, the, the police would arrive and arrest strikers who had done nothing wrong or violent. All of these unwarranted arrests and a small great boycott Caesar started caught the attention of the United States Senate. So a small group of Senate members came to the town of Delano to investigate, and among those people was Robert F. Kennedy. During this meeting, meeting, Kennedy addressed the reports of the unwarranted arrests of the strikers to the Delano officials. If I have reason to believe that there's going to be a riot started and somebody tells me that there's going to be trouble if you don't stop them, then it's my duty to stop them. And well, then you go out and arrest them? Well, absolutely. And charge them? How can you go arrest somebody if they haven't violated the law? They're ready to violate the law. In other words... But I suggest in the interim period of time, in the luncheon period of time, that the sheriff and the district attorney read the Constitution of the United States. Kennedy's visit to Delano gained national attention from all over the country and informed the country of their problem. The day afterward, Chavez thought of another way to gain the nation's attention, a protest march from Delano to Sacramento. On March 17, 1966, Around 70 farm workers and volunteers started the march from Delano to Sacramento. Soon after passing each town, more and more people started to join the march, and more joined the strike. In the next couple of days, people from all over California and the U.S. joined in the march. After 25 days, Chavez and his march had finally reached Sacramento. The march gained national attention and showed everyone that the farm workers were being exploited at the time, and they were not alone in the struggle and that together, they could make changes. The march also helped Chavez unite all the farm workers, not just the Mexicans, but the Filipinos, and everyone else who was being exploited, and they were able to do that on the simple human strength. Soon, as the strike went into its second year, there were still no changes, so they turned to their most powerful nonviolent tactic, the boycott. Cesar Chavez started a strike against the biggest California grape producer, Jamara Vineyards. However, girls were still threatened and intimidated strikers. People began to get frustrated, leaving them to resort to violence. And when Chavez got word of what was happening, he began to isolate himself at an old labor camp and went on a fast for nonviolence. He said that, I'd rather lose a strike than to start violence on our side. That would be completely wrong. Days turned into weeks, and Caesar was still going on with his fast. People in the following weeks during his fast joined the strike, and talk of violence was no more. As the fast went on, doctors began to worry about Caesar's health, as it may be fatal. Then, on the 25th day of the fast, Chavez ended his fast as he saw that many people joined the union and had gained support. After getting more support, the grape strike Caesar's char Caesar started earlier went into full force. Then in 1969, Chavez sent 40 different organizers to 40 different cities, from San Francisco and Los Angeles, California, to Boston, Massachusetts, and even to New York City. Additionally, they even sent people to Vancouver, Canada. The goal of the organizers was to arrive at a city that they were assigned to and to stop the grapes. There, strike organizers would get support from an array of different groups, telling them the struggle farm workers were facing. They gave him support from schools, church groups, labor unions, etc. Together, they all passed out flyers telling people to boycott the grapes and the harsh conditions farm workers are facing out in the fields. Strikers and organizers also asked people to boycott supermarkets that sold California grapes. In 1970, a Harris poll estimated that over 17 million people stopped buying grapes. This hurt growers financially, and many grapes went unsold and began to rot in stores. Then, in April 1970, one grape grower, Coachella Valley Growers, signed an agreement with Chavez and his union, giving rights to farm workers. This was the catalyst that caused the surrender of all grape growers. All grapes from then on were labeled with a black eagle symbol, and people were told to buy grapes that only had the black eagle symbol. Grapes with that symbol soon began to fly off shelves and put enough pressure on all the growers and made them sur all surrender, as it was drastically hurting growers financially. It was all over. 
it was all over. On July 29, 1970, all grape growers, including Jamara Vineyard, all signed contracts giving farm workers the rights they deserve. So, why does this all matter in the end? Why would it matter to us if farm workers did get their rights? Well, it matters because it opened opportunities for low class families and Hispanics. They fought for their rights, not just so that the work is not unbearable anymore, but to better the future of their family and children. Most of them, being Hispanic, fled their country's poverty to give their children a better life and to open the doors of opportunity for them. Once they got to this country, they saw they couldn't do that, so they fought to give their children a better life. It was because they gained rights and better pay why there are so many Hispanics and racial minorities who are in office and are in high political positions. Why so many Hispanics have a successful career. It was because the migrant farm workers gained the rights they needed to give their families a better life. Today, Cesar Chavez still impacts us all as he demonstrated the importance of taking a stand to fight against inequality and how the power of nonviolence can make a difference.